It's a pleasure to be here. I know I'm talking to a lot of very senior communicators, but would it be fair to say that many of us still struggle with evaluation, particularly at an outcome or an impact level? Would that be a fair statement? Um, I thought I'd start then by sharing um, a tool with you that I found just very recently that uh, potentially could evaluate many things, even big data. I found this in, the, um, in a hardware store in the Midlands of England. Um, maybe that's what we need. <laughs> Um, but more seriously, um, what I'd like to do today is go a little bit back into the past and, and then into the future. I particularly want to talk about some of the latest developments uh, that are happening because I have the benefit of sitting on uh, AMIX, the Association for Measurement and Evaluation of Communication, on their academic board, and they've just developed a new framework for evaluation. That some of anyone aware of the new AMIC framework? Had a look at it? Yes, a few. Good. Um, I'm also on a US uh, standards committee that's looking at trying to establish standards uh, for the language and the terms we use in evaluation. I'm on the Evaluation Council of the UK government um, and I've written books on the subject. So um, I'm going to talk a bit about some of the very latest things with standards and some of the new frameworks and models. Um, but I'm also going to just start by going back, stepping back a little just to remind ourselves one of a few fundamentals, because if we often get the fundamentals wrong, uh, and that prevents evaluation. But also, in going back, I want to just share with you a few thoughts that we looked at in the, in the standards body in the US, because we were looking at where these various frameworks come from. You'd all be familiar with the European Commission's framework uh, for evaluation. Some of you, obviously, are familiar with the AMEC one, but often we're not sure where these came from, who made up these these terms of inputs and outputs and outtakes. So I'm going to do those two things, a few fundamentals, a little bit of history, and I think they'll help understand these frameworks and why they are the way they are and where they're heading to. One of the fundamentals, of course, is the Barcelona Principles, first written in 2010, um, but updated fairly importantly in, uh, in 2015. And really, there's only two words on this slide that I wanted to emphasize, and that is, um, the shift from outputs to outcomes. Overall, our industry does a reasonably good job of measuring outputs. We monitor the media and we track outputs. Where we've struggled in the past is moving beyond outputs to measure outcomes. And I'm going to share with you today a few thoughts that I think, and a few, a few examples that show how fundamental it is that we get to outcomes. Another very thing, another key fundamental that we hear about all the time and it sounds like repeating the obvious, but having smart objectives. Uh, I do a lot of evaluation of evaluation. And when I find evaluation hasn't worked or hasn't been able to demonstrate outcomes, it's very often because the objectives were not really smart. And it's probably the first two elements of that that let us down. Smart means specific, but that means specific to the extent that there should be numbers and dates and percentages in your objectives. Raising awareness is not not measurable, because how much, by when. So one tip is we really need numbers and dates and percentages. And that, of course, means tying ourselves to a target, but that's what we have to do if we want to measure. The other big one I wanted to measure, though, is the measurable, the M. And that is we've got to design evaluation in at the planning stage. Um, I've tried it in my, my career, but it's very difficult to add evaluation on after you've planned a campaign. Uh, you're out of money, you're out of time, and very often you don't have the right baseline data to compare to. So the time when, when evaluation is successful is when you've designed the strategy and the evaluation at the same, in the same period. <clears throat> Third fundamental is recognizing that evaluation is a series of steps or stages. And this is something I think we haven't really reflected on enough. Um, there's often a thought that evaluation comes at the end you know, all that important creative work, all that important strategic work, and we do the activities, and then we have to evaluate. And of course, technically, evaluation is defined as coming in three types. There is formative evaluation, uh, process evaluation, and summative. And some of us do formative evaluation, uh, and some of us skip over it fairly quickly. Uh, maybe that's because our industry is primarily made up of creative people. I don't know whether you've reflected on how many in the room have backgrounds in accountancy, economics, statistics? Anyone? Oh, we've got a couple. I think only one hand. How many have got arts, languages, communication, 
humanities. Me too. You know, we come from those backgrounds. So our kind, we love to produce stuff. We love creativity. We like designing things and websites. And our instinct is to do that. But actually, before we do that, we've really got to have data. We've got to have baseline data. We've got to do pre-testing. And then having done formative evaluation, of course, we move on to monitoring and tracking our outputs. And this is where we are fairly good. By and large, the industry tracks a lot of outputs and reports them. And then as you move along in communication, of course, then there's the monitoring and tracking of some of the early immediate outcomes. And here's where we're not so good. We start to struggle when we, when we move away from putting out things to what is the response we're getting. And of course, some things are easier today. We, we've got likes and follows and shares and things we can track on social. But even so, what does a like mean? What does a follow mean? I follow UK politicians mainly to see how silly they are at times. Right? Doesn't mean I value their views. Um, and then, of course, the really big area is moving on to summative evaluation where we're tracking those immediate outcomes, whether we're changing awareness or attitudes, all the way, hopefully, one day on to impact. What is the impact of our work? And even beyond impact to what are the insights and learnings that we can take around the loop into the next stage of planning. Evaluation is this cycle. Um, and we tend to do the middle part well and we skip through the first part and we tend to struggle with the last part. <clears throat> um, at the AMIC Summit over the last three years, where we present allegedly world's best practice and evaluation, one of the things I was intrigued by, and I, I see if you've ever seen one, I've, have you ever seen a case study presented of a, of a campaign that failed? I haven't. And the AMIC, AMIC every year has case studies presented. So this year I presented a case study of a campaign that failed. And what was interesting is we learned more from that campaign than we had in any previous campaign. We learned a whole lot about our audience, a whole lot about changing channels and so forth. And so <clears throat> that's a few fundamentals of evaluation. And the, the reason I'm putting that cycle up is we've got to resist any thought that there is a single magic bullet or a single method or a premier method for evaluating. Because when we think of evaluation as that cycle, or if you like, a series of steps and stages from gathering information, putting out information, and then maybe someone's received it, and then maybe someone's paid attention to it. What we're doing is getting back into fundamentals. So my step back into the past, <clears throat> and what we did in the, in the US recently in looking at these evaluation frameworks, we said, why are they built the way they are? Why are they built often as program logic models where they look at various stages? And it's because, and I'm only using one example here, but a very basic model of communication from W.J. Maguire, Handbook of Social Psychology. I saw this about 20 years ago, and I have to confess, it, it made me stop and think because it was presented to me by an academic at the time, and I was a very keen practitioner, and he asked me what I did, and I explained all of my work. And he said, so Jim, you're presenting information to your audience. And I said, yes. And he said, what evidence do you have that you got their attention? Uh, I didn't have any. What evidence that they understood it? What evidence do you have that they accept it, that they retain the information, and that they did anything with it? I realized that day I was one-sixth of a communicator because I couldn't present that evidence. Now, that's a very basic model, and Maguire has gone on to more advanced models, but this type of thinking is what guides most communication. In the advertising industry, you're probably all aware of the age-old ADA model, Awareness, Interest, Desire, Action. And of course, that comes straight from W.J. Maguire. They simplified it to four stages. Maguire now says that there are more than uh, six stages. <coughs> Excuse me. Latest Maguire says there are 13 stages, and I won't take you through them all. But it's just there to remind ourselves that from the very first step of exposure of our messages, all the way through to action and behavior, and Maguire now says even beyond behavior, there's advocacy. When we turn our target audiences, if you want to call them that, into advocates. That's even better than a single individual's behavior. Um, so the reason I'm, I'm emphasizing that is whatever we do in evaluation, it's got to move down that response chain, as we call it. There's no one thing to measure. We can measure exposure. We can measure attention, interest, desire. Why is this important? 
isn't it complex? Why wouldn't it, wouldn't it be simpler to be able to measure one bit? Well, how many of you do campaigns or projects? Any of you do, I ask you this way, any of you do a project or a campaign where the impact can be achieved within one year? How many of you? How many of you do campaigns where the impact is likely to take a number of years? Maybe four, five years? That's the point. That impact and outcomes are difficult to achieve. They do take time. Whatever the campaign, whether it's, whether it's promoting the ideals of the, the European Union or whether it's child, addressing childhood obesity, you know, these things do not happen overnight. So therefore, evaluation, there's no point in measuring one thing or actually waiting till the end. We might be waiting a long time. And now, I don't know about you, but my bosses are not very patient. They want results. And so what I'm setting up to explain is the reason we design various project, project logic models and various models of evaluation is this idea of measuring a series of steps, that at each step of the chain you can show you're on the right track. Now I'm only going to flick through some of these, but these are just some of the models that have been presented over the years. This is an early 1985 model of a series of steps. You'll notice two things about these models that I flick through, and I'm just going to show you seven or eight of them. They're all in steps or stages, but the other slightly more negative thing is the language constantly changes. Our industry has gone off and reinvented the wheel every few years, so here we've got preparation, implementation and impact. I wrote a model in 1992, see I'm really old, um, inputs, outputs and results, and we're starting to see the language of project, project, uh, pr program logic models. Um, I, I corrected that later to inputs, outputs, outcomes. You're all familiar with this language, I'm sure. And it's not the only way to think about evaluation, but it's one of the dominant tools. The problem then is the various industries of advertising and PR, <coughs> strategic comms, goes off in different directions. So Walter Lindemann in the US says this is the best model, and he has outputs, outgrowths, and outcomes. And this is sort of, you know, outgrowth sounds slightly cancerous in a way. Tom Watson in the UK has a model in his textbook and he says there's input, outputs, impact and effect. I'm not quite sure what effects are after impact, but that's another model. So you're seeing the language. No wonder we're confused. The language has gone all over the place. Um, the communication controlling model developed in Germany. Inputs, outputs, outcomes, outflow. So we have more language. The European Commission, of course, has done a lot of work in this area. Uh, the better regulation guidelines talk about inputs, outputs, results and impact, very close to some of the other models. But the latest model um, that I've seen in the literature, um, and here we have a, the, actually being visualised as a program logic model, which is very common. But the stages are identified as activities, relevance, output, outtakes. Yet another term comes into our language, and outcomes. <coughs> um, this model has many benefits to it, or this framework, because it's adopting a series of steps and stages, and it's also starting to populate those stages to say, what are we talking about? What is happening in each stage? I'd have some criticisms, I suppose, though, because I'm not quite sure why relevance is positioned where it is. Uh, you I mentioned smart objectives before. Can you see where relevance fits there? It's the R of smart objectives. Here it's positioned after activities. I don't think we want to do our activities and then decide whether they're relevant. So we've, we've struggled with this. So what we did in the US, in the standards body, is we analysed 2,400 articles and book chapters about evaluation, not just in communication, but we looked at project management, we looked at international development, we looked at a whole lot of other fields because we're not the only people who do evaluation. And we went back to the very beginning to try and address where did all these terms come from. Now, I'm not going to <coughs> say there's one single model, but when you look at other industries um, that use program logic models, two of the most widely used models I'll show you, you may be familiar with, one is the Kellogg Foundation model, used extensively in international development and then in development communication, also been adopted into project management and even into business performance management. So other industries are using these frameworks and the key terms, inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, impact. 
Another very widely used model in development is the um, <coughs> University of Wisconsin model, inputs, outputs, outcomes, impact. They are slightly different. They break outputs down into activities, so very similar. And they separate outcomes into short, medium and long term. Um, don't even try and read this slide necessarily, <clears throat> but just to explain the process we went through. What we then did is we took some of the classic logic models, the ones used in other industries, and we looked at the terms and the stages, and then we mapped onto it 12 of the most widely used communication evaluation frameworks. What we're trying to do is identify <clears throat> what is best practice, what, it, what should be a standard. Because there's two ways to develop standards. One way is that some expert writes a standard and try, or a committee and then imposes it upon the industry. Uh, I'm not very much in favour of that approach. Another approach is you study the industry closely to see what most people are doing. And so all we've done here, and the figures down the right-hand side are the most important, what we found is that across all of the commonly used evaluation frameworks, not only in communication but in other fields, 14 out of 15 of the most commonly used measure outputs. No big surprise. We do too. But 12 of the fields also measure outcomes and use that term. Nine measure inputs and also use that term. Five measure impact. And four, believe it or not, use outtakes. So <clears throat> I'm not here to tell you that there is a standard or a single way to do it. But one thing we did come away concluding, and this has only happened in the last month or two, is that across all the literature, the most commonly used framework is a five-stage or a six-stage framework using inputs, activities, outputs, outcomes, and impact. Or you can divide outcomes into short, medium, long term. This drawing just simply summarizes the two main approaches, five or six stages. Everyone agrees on inputs, activities, and outputs. Some will call early short-term outcomes, they'll call that outtakes. So outtakes is another term for the very early or short-term outcomes. And some will call <coughs> long-term outcomes impact. And so what we've tried to do there is just condense this down to make sense of the terminology. As I said, I'm not telling you that's the framework you should use, but to me that's what some of the latest work is, is attempting to do. Now, a very important point about this whether you agree on five or six stages. To me, why, what's the real bottom line of why we should do evaluation and why should we do it at the upper end, the outcomes, the impact? Well, here's the thing. In a management perspective, inputs, activities and outputs, while we're doing those, we are a cost centre. Right? We're adding no value. We are just spending the organisation's money. And from a senior management point of view, they don't like people who spend money. When you start to produce outcomes, and you can, it's only when you start to produce outcomes, short, medium, long term, and demonstrate impact, we become a value-adding centre. And management likes value-adding centres. So for so long, from a business perspective, our industry has been measuring things that really only demonstrate how much we put out and how much money we spend. Is it any wonder we're not sort of getting to where we want to be? So to me, that's the most compelling reason that we have to get to measuring outcomes and impact because that's when we can demonstrate value. And I've worked in this industry as a practitioner and an academic researcher for nearly 40 years. And I know that this industry, this strategic communications industry does add value. I see it regularly, but we often don't have the evidence to prove it. And so just a few of the most latest models is the UK government um, has its 2016 framework and you'll see it closely follows what we've just been talking about. Inputs, outputs, outtakes, outcomes and they call the last stage organisational outcomes. Not perfect. I find the last stage a little bit self-centred, for example. Um, we want to achieve our outcomes. What about our stakeholders? outcomes and impact. What about societies? State, isn't it interesting? Stakeholders and society do not appear on any of the evaluation frameworks that we've identified. Isn't that interesting? So that's another little takeaway point perhaps that to me perhaps evaluating 
our impact for our organisation, but also our impact on our stakeholders and society. Because in government, it should be the same thing. But it's certainly not in corporations. In corporations, you can maximise profit, and you can do that in a way that achieves the organisation's objectives, but doesn't necessarily achieve society's objectives. The other good thing about this framework is it starts to populate those stages, because I'm talking about frameworks. But, you know, you'd be forgiven for saying, well, frameworks aren't a lot of use to us at an operational level. Frameworks are very broad. And so the next stage, though, is to say, well, when we say outputs, what do we mean? And I think we know that one. When we say outtakes, what do we mean? Because the, there were two things I found in studying evaluation over 20 years. And I mentioned one of them is not getting smart objectives. The other, the other key finding was we measure the wrong thing at the wrong stage. By that I mean, example, <clears throat> we measure volume of publicity. And I see some PR agencies say that's a result or an outcome. Do you agree? I mean, a pile of publicity may have had no effect whatsoever. So clearly that's taking an output measure and putting it into the wrong, the wrong box. And so what we're trying to do in the, in the latest work in the evaluation standards and frameworks is not only have a framework with consistent language, but also to, to, to recognise what are the metrics that are appropriate to each stage. And so awareness and understanding and interest and engagement. And we don't just want to have one. Because as I mentioned, the bit of background I went into about all those steps and stages, if your final impact is two, three, four, five years downstream, then you need to be able to measure interim steps. Maybe I'm just working on a campaign, for example, or advising on a campaign, that, and it's a classic, organ donation. Think about if you had to evaluate an organ, don anyone do an organ donation campaign? Tom does. Well, <clears throat> if, you, if you want to get the impact very quickly, you kill people <laughs> because you want their organs. Clearly socially unacceptable. So this would be a campaign that you don't really want to achieve the outcome and the impact. So how would you measure it? Well, that's where this model, these models prove their worth because we can measure people registering to be an organ donor. We can measure their stated intentions to be an organ donor. We don't really want them to have to donate their organs, ideally. So we don't... It's a classic example of demonstrating why we need multiple incremental evaluation steps. And some of you have seen the latest AMIC framework, which is... <coughs> I apologise again for my voice. I hope it's not too bad to listen to. It sounds terrible up here. The, this was just launched in June. And again, we're not saying this is perfect. I think it's, got a, it's going to go through some refinements. Um, but this was a result of consultation around the world <clears throat> with about 50 organisations, with academics. There's a couple of things that are a step forward. And the title of this session, I think, is Moving Forward. All of the frameworks I've shown you so far are on paper. And, you know, we live in a digital age, so come on, guys, get with it. So for the first time, this framework, we designed it as a web application. So it's a Windows 10 look and feel. It's an online tool where you can enter your data, you can save your data, and you can use it. Um, this framework went for a six-stage model, entering objectives first, and then inputs, activities, outputs, outtakes, outcomes, and impact. Now, whether you agree that six stages is good or too many, whether you prefer a five-stage model, I'm a little bit leaning towards a five-stage model <clears throat> because even I start to struggle with the difference between um, outtakes and early outcomes and then late-stage outcomes and impact. They get to be quite blurred. But it's an online tool, and what's good about an online tool is you can go into the tool and you can enter your objectives. Now, we haven't programmed this in yet, but we are thinking of programming in that if you start to enter your activities and you haven't entered your objectives, you guys wouldn't do it, but some do. The computer will say no. And you'll have to get your objectives very specific first. Because the aim is to relate each of the stages back to the objectives. The other good thing, as I said, and it's, it's really trying to guide people and, and be a helpful tool. If you go into any of those stages, say, uh, say outcomes, <clears throat> 
it'll give you a very simple definition. It'll give you fields to enter. And then if you click on the information button, if you're not sure, and I'm sorry, the text is very grey on your screen probably, but it will give you a pop-up with suggestions of what could be there. And if you try to say, I'll put in press clippings, you know, no, it's not an outcome. But it'll tell you this should be you know, attitude change, behavioural change, uh, and so forth. And even the definition, it says, um, list here evidence, not anecdotes, evidence of effects of your communication. So we're trying to separate out the results of your communication versus other activities on your target audience. So it's a very simple definition. But it's remarkable how we see impact, but often don't show causation of the impact back to communication. Or we show impact, and it's not necessarily on our target audience. That's the classic example of the PR agency that gets a lot of publicity, but how much of it really reached your target audience. Um, <clears throat> this is just a case study example of someone who has used the AMIC framework. Um, it's a bit fuzzy there, it's a screenshot. But if you can, I think these slides will be available. Or you can go online. All of this is available online. You do not have to be an AMIC member. It's all open, open source work, including the case studies. So we're getting case studies to use it and go in and start to give real examples of what might fit in each stage. The other thing we have done, though, <clears throat> that I've been involved with, is to further guide people. The hard part, as I said, is populating those stages. You know, and and giving ourselves clues of what could we measure at an outcome, outcome, sorry, early outcome, late outcome, impact stage. And I use the example of organ donation as a great example where, you know, you don't want to be measuring the impact necessarily. So what can you measure? And um, you know, that's just a close-up um, <clears throat> of a blood and transplant. This is not organ, but it's blood. blood blood's a lot easier to, to campaign than organs. As I was saying, the hardest thing is the population of what goes into those stages. And so what we have also done online, and I don't expect you to read this here, but if you go online, you can look at a taxonomy. And we, we from those 2,400 articles, we looked at all of the metrics that are used right across industries. And with a lot of work, we started to categorise those metrics into whether it was agreed, are they an output, are they an outcome? Are they an impact? And so <clears throat> what this document does is under the columns of inputs, activities, outputs, outtakes, we've put a definition. We've listed the key steps. What are we talking about? So outputs are distribution, exposure, reception. <coughs> Whereas outtakes... <coughs> excuse me. Outtakes... Attention, awareness, interest, liking, engagement. Because this is where the industry gets very confused. I regularly see engagement listed as an outcome. And you say to people, well, why do you want engagement? Well, usually we want engagement in order to do something else, don't we? We don't just want engagement per se. Because people can engage with us to criticise us. We want engagement as a pathway to building relationships and so forth. And then under the, those key steps, we've gone even more specific and said, what are some of the metrics that you could measure there? And so to some extent, it's a little bit of an idiot's guide to evaluation, but we often need prompting. The matrix gets, it's, a bit, it's different to some matrices in that it reads left to right. It gets more difficult as you move left to right. But also rather than top right being the optimum corner, we put in the, in the bottom row there, we put the metrics ranging from basic getting more advanced. So as you drill down, and this document goes on, you can scroll down to even looking at the methods. And so at each stage, we put basic things. So under outputs, media monitoring, basic media metrics, reach. I still, believe it or not, work with advertising agencies who tell me reach and recall. You've seen this? Recall is the number one metric still used. I can recall plenty of ads that I hate. Can't you? I can recall lots of ads that I'd never, ever buy the product. So, I mean, this is where we're... So, recall is not invalid. It's just in the wrong column. Recall is a good early measure of attention or interest. They can recall. 
but it's not, it's not an outcome. So where, where this does serve a purpose and it looks like a really big list, think of it as a lookup table. It's a lookup table to say, am I putting my metrics in the right place? Because reach is, is only an output measure. Recall is only uh, an early stage outtake, perhaps. Whereas we need surveys and we need opinion, opinion research and so forth to measure more outcomes and impact. And as I mentioned with um, things like difficult campaigns like organ donation, up here in the top under outcomes, you'll see satisf you know, satisfaction, trust, preference, intention. Because those are useful things to remind ourselves is that it's a, this communication being a progressive series of steps that people may need to learn new knowledge, acquire new knowledge. Then they might change their attitude. Then they might form trust. Then they might have a preference. Then they might have an intention. So to me, it's a matter of seeing how far we can get down that response chain. And that makes measurement and evaluation much more practical. Because the truth is, in any 12 months, and most of us have got a report within a campaign period or a 12 month period, you're not always, rarely are you going to be able to get all the way to impact. Right? And it's a matter of moving down that chain. So, um, the other key thing about that evaluation taxonomy that I think is useful is we've deliberately included low cost and no cost methods. So the reason it starts with basic things is we also recognise that not every project or campaign has a big budget. In fact, to be totally honest, not every campaign or project needs a lot of evaluation. We generally will evaluate and spend a lot of time on evaluation on big budget or high risk campaigns, but something you've done several times in the past and it seems to have worked Maybe that doesn't need a lot of evaluation. Or maybe we can use some low-cost methods. Um, I also, these are just me finishing with some practical tips. Because you know, I stand here as an academic, but I spent 30 years doing this. And what I found is a very important thing is start small and work up. Um, one of my five favourite things is to do pilot studies. Even talking big governments into doing things. Often management don't want to fund it. Anyone have that problem? They don't want to fund evaluation. They don't want to fund serious evaluation. So start with a, say, let's do a pilot project. Let's just test one thing. It's much, much easier to approve a small project, and then you can prove that it works, and then you move on. So I think this starting with small and working our way up is important. <clears throat> I mentioned at the beginning, learning from failures. Don't sweep them under the carpet. Hide them. Or don't ever speak about them again. Learn from... Uh, what doesn't work so well, because communication, that response chain I talk about, that all the way from exposure to advocacy, that's not, that's not an easy, easy, achievable thing. Communication is really, really difficult. And it doesn't always work. We, we sort of pretend it does. Who's got children in the room? Who's got teenagers particularly? When you tell them things, they always do what you want. Right? We know from our own families yeah, my wife tells me things and I don't do it. And she reminds me. Communication doesn't always work easy and fluently. Why? Because other things get in the way. Context, other messages, competing messages. All of those things happen. So we've got to be a lot more honest that your work may be brilliant, but contextual factors and external factors, competing messages can disrupt the, that pro process. And it's about identifying those and, and doing that tracking. Of course, a very practical thing is visualise findings. Uh, I find with management, unless it's a picture, they don't really have time to read it or see it. So visualising. And these days we can visualise qualitative as well as quantitative. Um, word, simple things like word clouds and thematic maps uh, are ways of visualising uh, qualitative work. <clears throat> I recently read a report of a public consultation and it was 52 pages long. And I thought to myself, there's no way anyone's going to read that. And it was full of vital information of public opinion. Um, and it could have been visualised into some thematic cluster maps or word clouds that says, these are the big issues people are concerned about. And even a politician would have understood that. Right. So busy management, they want their dashboards, they want their simple charts. I think this is my last little bit. I was um, going around talking to workshops and that I thought... There are barriers to evaluation, and I thought there's a, a, a number of additional things that I see in when I'm evaluating evaluation. 
Um, and these are big things. This is coming out of my current research uh, that I'm doing. Often we don't access the available information. Um, in the academic world, the first thing we do in any campaign is we do a literature review. We look at what else, what other research is out there. And I find very often in, in, in government and corporate strategic communication, there's a tendency to build a campaign and to not access uh, case studies and available data. Uh, so literature review, uh, I love borrowing OP, other people's research. Uh, and I'm finding this um, in that government across the channel that recently made a strange decision. I'm finding that they have massive amounts of research. Um, and it's unrecognised as, as data. Things like public consultation reports, correspondence, complaints data. We've got to broaden our understanding of data. Um, I think that's one thing, because accessing available data, we often look at the uh, simple surveys and polls. There's also a lack of data sharing I'm seeing, and I, I can't speak for the, for the European Commission or your, or your institutions, but certainly in a lot of places I work, we gather this data and it sits in silos. So I'm working with the UK government at the moment and I'm finding that the Department of Health is doing surveys but the NHS has already done them and it's just bizarre. But they don't seem to work together. Now, maybe that's a characteristic of our friends across the channel or maybe it's endemic, I don't know. But making, you know, learning how to data share, learning knowledge management, um, building relationships, these are important. And then married to that same point is lack of data analysis. We talk about getting deep insights, but you don't get deep insights from a little bit of quantitative data. It tends to need mixed method, quantitative, and usually qualitative data is required. And that means we've got to have skills in textual, content, thematic analysis. Across our industry, I find we're very good at surveys. We do a few focus groups. We love media analysis and media monitoring. But it actually, from what I can see, about 5% of the communication industry uses advanced qualitative text analysis work. And yet there's deep insights often in that. So that's one of my practical tips, broadening our access to data, sharing data, and broadening our skills in qualitative data analysis. Um, <clears throat> I sometimes, and this is not me criticizing, this is a, a, a report I get, is very often um, communicators say, well, we don't have the resources or we don't actually have advanced research methodology knowledge. And my practical tip there is, and some of you may do it, but actually it doesn't happen that often, is have an academic partner, even use interns. So I was sitting in an office recently and they've got a whole lot of data to analyse, qualitative, and they said, we don't know how to do it, we don't have the tools. It took two phone calls to get two very smart young master's students who were looking for a project to come in and do it in three weeks. And so just being a little bit creative, a lot of, um, a lot of government departments around the world now in my country, um, our state government in New South Wales has three or four academic partners. And, you know, they pay a little bit of funding here and there, but mostly it's free advice. And they do the evaluation, but very often at the planning stage, they'll bring in an academic advisor just for that extra perspective. So it's another practical tip, and you can sometimes get it for free. And, of course, the big one that I've touched on and that was sort of a key theme of mine today is this output to impact gap. We are so good at measuring our outputs, but that makes us only a cost centre, as I said. It's getting to outcomes and impact that makes us a value centre. And the, the only practical way I know is using those evaluation frameworks that I talked about, that, stepped, that series of steps across the program logic model or whatever models you use, um, using that as a bridge to go through that multi-stage uh, framework. And I think those things, like the evaluation frameworks and the taxonomy, uh, hopefully are useful. So that's my short overview, and I think we have a lot of time for questions and discussion. Thank you.